Welcome back. We're going to do a drawing of a self-portrait by an English miniaturist named George Richmond, created around 1830. And we're going to start this off. Um, I'm going to start it off sight size. Um, if you're working on a clipboard, you don't need to worry about sight size, but um, Notice I'm going to block everything in the same size as it appears on my screen. And I'm going to start by trying to capture the overall shape and tilt of the head. Notice the head is tilting just a little bit, just a few degrees. That way I can simplify the shape of the cranium. And we want this central line uh, to be slightly off-center, as I will explain in a second. So I lock my focus. Um, we want this line, if I go through the philtrum, through the center of the chin, through the point between the brows, notice we have got a little less space from here to here and a little more space from here to where the head ends on this side. And that's because the head is turned slightly to our left. One of our goals for the term is to get really good at doing uh, heads from different three-quarter angles. Uh, three-quarter just means anything that's not directly uh, front or side view. Um, so measure this. Make sure you didn't try to put that central line right in the center. It needs to be bumped over a little. And the line of the eyes is likewise not, not uh, horizontal. It's slightly tilted like that. Um, notice that his eyes are slightly above center. So I'm just shifting this, this line up a little. Um, another way we might describe that is he has rather a long face. Can everyone kind of feel that? Like his face is a little long compared to his cranium. Um, here's the indent of the eye socket on this side. And I'm going to go ahead and block in this, the form of this eyelid. Uh, notice it comes to within about an eye's width of the edge of the face. And the lid is really wide um, on the inside, and, and then it tapers and gets narrow towards the outside. Please press very lightly as you see me doing. Don't press too hard. And I'm just blocking in the shape of the uh, iris and giving it a, a very light first shading and a little fur shading underneath the eyelid, the lower lid, to create a little sense of the volume of the eye without, without any real definition, without making any firm decisions. Um, and I might have to bring in this plane change just a little bit. Um, I sort of made the mistake of trying to define the shape of the face a little too soon, so let me bring down that angle of the jaw. Now I'm leaning back, and I feel like that eye is about the right size and placement for this head. So I'm going to move on to the nose. Uh, the nose is... Well, first, where we expect the nose to be is about halfway between the brow line and the bottom of the chin. So I'm going to measure that visually, and I'm going to decide that the nose actually is pretty well centered on that space. Can you see what I just did? I measured here to the bottom of the chin, and the nose is just about centered on there. This is what I was measuring. 
And that's about where we expect it to be around the level of the bottom of the cranium. And for the width of the nose, I'm going to imagine some construction lines coming from the outside of the olive, following the angle of the head, and like that. And the outside of the nose is lo level even with the inside of the eyes. I know we didn't do this eye yet, but I'm just sort of guesstimating where it's going to go. Notice that the tip of the nose is slight, it projects out past the line of the face, so it's going to be slightly to the left of that first line we made. And that's going to allow us to create more foreshortening on this side of the nose and a little less foreshortening on the other side. Very subtle effect, but noticeable. That's all I'm going to do for the nose block in, but I'm just going to keep laying in some very faint shadow shapes, see if I can get this drawing to make sense in terms of light and dark. And there's a reason I'm not zooming in on my drawing, because I, I, haven't, I haven't done anything definite yet. We really want to keep this really faint. And I'm just sort of jumping around today, but I'm going to go ahead and shadow map this whole side of the cheek. Again, please use a lot of restraint. We're not, we're not pressing hard anywhere yet. And I'm going to lay in a first shading across this whole side of the face to give a little sense of the volume of the face. Um, this whole eye socket is in shadow. So I'm going to go ahead and do a first shading across that eye socket. And a first shading where the hair turns into shadow. What we're doing is working the drawing up from, from being very vague to being increasingly specific as we proceed. I'm even going to carry this going about a third of the way down where I expect the mouth to be. I'm going to do a little first shading across the upper lip, first shading under the bottom lip, maybe dropping the chin a hair. and a first shading across this side of the nose. Uh, an analogy that I use a lot is with sculpture. Um, we went ahead and drew this first eye in detail right from the start. But with the second eye, it's buried in shadow. And what, what I've done with my dark here is essentially I've sort of punched, punched this in like I would, if I was going to sculpt the eye, you would make a depression in the clay first to represent the eye socket. And then only then would you um, go in and sculpt the details of the eye. And that's sort of how we're approaching this. There's the eye socket, and now we're going to go ahead and um, zoom in a little for the first time. I'll get rid of these annotations. And we're going to draw this eye as it kind of sits in the eye socket. So there's the little shadow under the upper lid. Notice this lid also is very full towards the middle. Remember, this was the construction line we used for the nose, so that's now going to guide us in placing the eye 
Um, we're press, pressing just a little harder now because this has to kind of show up from within the, the shadow of the eye socket. And now I'm going to go just a little darker on the iris. I'm relating that form to the form of this lock of hair that we can, that we already drew. And now I'm going to go around and just sort of bring down, not pressing really hard yet, but just I'm starting to bring down my darks another step. And at this point, you should be able to assess what we call the gaze of the drawing. Um, notice that it feels in the original that he's sort of looking at us. It should feel that way in our drawings as well. So this would be the time to make an adjustment if you're not getting that feeling. I'm going to go just a hair darker on the tip of the nose. in the nostrils, and I'm going to clean up my light across the bridge of the nose and erase this construction line. And that feels like a good time for me to take a little break so that you can uh, start to catch up. So let me zoom out a little. And pause. Ready or not, we are going to get to the heart of the lesson here, which is um, how quickly some highlights can give your drawing solidity, make it easier to see, um, to see what you need to do next. So take your white pencil and I'm trying to pull this highlight along. I'm paying really careful attention to where it is. Notice that the shape of this highlight, the way it, it turns slightly to the left here, fades a little, and then comes to a little highlight. That defines the form. So you don't want to uh, just guess where it is. Really observe where it is carefully. and. This is something I do a lot in my own drawing is throw in some highlights before, before I've committed to my darkest darks. And the reason for that is because once those lights are in, it's so much easier to read the three-dimensionality of the form that it's actually going to help me put my darks in the right places. The shading direction with white is just the same as whatever you use for first shading. Um, with black, it's really the same. And you see how quickly just a few highlights um, creates an illusion of three-dimensionality on the form. It's, and it's really so satisfying that people tend to go overboard and they look for lights that aren't, aren't there, like I really wanted to throw some white um, on this cheek, but note, note there really isn't any, so I'm going to hold off. Um, this is a little surprising place that often gets a highlight. It's sort of um, where, the, uh, where the muzzle form meets the, the base of the nose right here is a is a little plane that projects outward and collects light. So that's good to be aware of. Um, here's another one right under the corner of the mouth. There's a little up plane. And the more you shade, especially with white, the more you come to you sort of know where to look for these little up, the, the large and small up planes. Um, 
There's just a little light on the top of the chin, barely any. And there's a big light on the temple up here. Uh, one amateur mistake that we see all the time is people make these big lights um, too dark because they're, they don't look that bright because they have light all around them, but they're actually just as bright as the small highlights. And people make these small highlights like this one too bright because they have more dark around them so they stand out more, but that doesn't mean they're actually brighter than the than the big highlights. So now if you squint and look at your drawing, you're going to see um, it has a solidity that it didn't have a minute ago. And that's going to actually help guide your hand, and it's going to help you to make better decisions going forward. Um, so one thing I'm noticing about my drawing is I s this is sort of where the bottom of the chin is, but he's got a little bit of his throat showing down past that, which is going to give him a little more fullness on that side of his face. Um, the collar comes up about to the same level as the top of the chin. As I've mentioned before, in a mirror self-portrait, you're you get that this peculiar effect with the eyes because um, when he's looking at one of his eyes, both his eyes are focused to that side, and when he looks at the other eye, both his eyes are focused the other direction. So um, you get a strangely, it just slightly out of focus. Um, gaze in a mirror self-portrait that you do not get from a, if you work from a photograph. That's one of the ways anyone looking at your portfolio can easily identify that you are working from a mirror, which is typically more impressive if you can do something like this from a mirror than from a photograph, because you're still basically working from a three-dimensional reference. And at this point, because we've been very vague with where the features start and end, um, the process of drawing, if you're doing it right, should start to feel a little more like the process of sculpture. See if I bring this shadow edge over a little, I've just sort of brought the, brought the, the uh, bridge of the nose in slightly towards the center. It should start to feel not like you're coloring in something, but that you are modeling something the way you'd model something with clay. And you know you're doing it right. If it just starts to feel a little bit like that, um, you'll know you're on the right track. You're really pushing light around to create the illusion of form. But the emphasis here is, here is not on the shapes of the light, but on the actual forms that we're able to read. And you'll notice I'm just, I'm starting to press a little harder. Some of my dark accents, as I get more confident that they're in the right place, I can go a little harder with them. Um, no matter where you are in your drawing, why don't you just 
uh, pause and let's let's focus together on the place we started, which was this eye. And now that we're using a darker line, we can analyze what's going on here. So this is the skin fold. This is the darkest dark. It's a shadow accent. There's really no light going up into that fold. And then notice that the upper surface of this lid is darker than the surface above it. And that's no surprise because this surface up here is receiving reflected light that this surface is not. So within shadows, we sort of get that this upside down world where things that face down are brighter and things that face up are darker. Um, this lower lid, though, is not darker. It's receiving a little bit of ambient light. So this reads not as a highlight, but just as, a, just as the color of the paper. To bring that little shelf of skin out, we shade lightly around it like this. And that causes that little piece of skin to project out a little bit. Um, this is really nice the way this, there's a cast shadow of the lid onto the white of the eye there that's pretty dark. A lot of beginners are afraid to touch the white of the eye. They think it has to stay white. But if it's in shadow, it's going to be darker than the surrounding skin. And finally, the iris. Notice the iris is a little darker on the left because that's where the light is coming from. And the iris is basically an inverted cone, so this side of the iris is in shadow. Look at how much light this side of the iris is getting. It's really just as bright here as the white of the eye, if not a little brighter. That's because the light is, is shining this way and it's illuminating the inside of that cone. And here's the pupil. That's the one place in the whole face that we can go to black. Press as hard as you want, just right there. And for some reason, he really doesn't have eyebrows. Maybe he's blonde or something. I don't know. His, his bangs seem dark, so I don't really know why his eyebrows are so faint. But um, Every beginner, e even, even me, with all my experience, like you're gonna want to like take your white pencil and just lighten the whites of the eyes. Um, Richmond obviously did not do that. This is not in full light. It's sort of in half tone. So the, it's a real sign of sophistication to just save his whites for these highlights on the skin and just not even go near the eyes with his white pencil. Um, we may as well go across to the other eye, which is actually drawn in a kind of surprising way. Because um, the pupil is not, is barely visible. Because there's so much reflected light along the bottom of the iris, probably bouncing up from his collar, um, that He's suppressed all the, all the details uh, within the eye. And the other sign of that strong reflected light is that this plane change along the lower margin of the eyelid is light with half tones on either side of it. Um, it would take much more time than we have to do all these details justice. So let's just at least darken this skin fold. Look at the 
top surface of the bottom lid is really dark right at the corner because it's getting no, no reflected light there. And then a weird little brightening right here. I think he even used a touch of white there uh, to this strong reflected light coming up from his collar and just hitting the outside corner of his eye. Um, do your best to keep up with me. When I move on, you can just move on with me and go back to um, what you didn't get to. You'll have plenty of time at the end to finish. So, But we're going to take a look together at the nose. Um, most of you had trouble drawing the nose as asymmetrical as it is. In other words, you mostly wanted to draw the um, you wanted to make the curve of the nose and you wanted the parentheses to be symmetrically around the curve. And what I explained to you is this curve is way to the left. We see less of this ala and a lot more of this one. So check your work. Make sure that's what it needs to be. And just look at the subtlety of this little darkening across the top of the ala here to indicate that plane change. Um, there's a little bleed of this core shadow up towards the tip of the nose to indicate that plane change. And this nostril is barely showing, it's peeking out here from behind the tip of the nose. Very dark here and a very small little dark cast shadow underneath. And this ala is much more facing us, this nostril. So we see relatively more of that one. And the darkest point on the nose is actually this Except besides the nostril, it's this cast shadow behind the ala. And now we're going to take a look at the mouth. Make sure that, before you do anything with the mouth, make sure the all is in the right place. You see how mine's a little too far to the left because I let this half tone creep across a little too far to the left of the nose. Um, you're not going to get the mouth in the right place if the all is not in the right place. So um, I'm going to also yeah, I need to shift my ala over about a sixteenth of an inch to the right. Can you see how easy that was? It's just like it's just like moving a sculpted form. It's it's I just bumped this over and this over and it was just it shifted that form closer to where I needed it to be. And now that I'm happier with that, I can more accurately locate the curve the seam between the lips, which remember is always the most important part of the mouth to get right. It's, it's identified in this drawing by this cast shadow and a beautiful cupid's bow. And this outside corner of the mouth comes out a little bit past the curve of the nose, so I'm going to bring it out just a little further. And 
So on this side, again, just like the nose is not symmetrical, the mouth, this, uh, this curve is much longer than the one on the left. So some of you in your still life drawings may want to um, use some white highlights in your final drawings, especially if you're creating drawings of surfaces that are reflective or shiny. Um, and but in order for those white highlights to show, you obviously have to work on paper that's not pure white. So it's partly why I'm introducing this today is to get you used to uh, working on paper that's not that's not white. And in order to get that reflected light on the upper lip, what we need to do is darken the upper margin of it. Um, the core shadow is up above that seam and leave that reflected light alone. So did I bring the corner of the mouth too far out? Yes, I did. Just a little. Okay, good time to back out, see how we're doing. I'm gonna darken through the core shadow on the cheekbone. Try to follow his shading direction to the extent that you can read it. Notice he's very disciplined on these soft curves, shading across the sh shadow edge. Good idea to erase the shadow map first if you didn't do that already. And I kind of ran out of room in my chin. So I've got to bring that highlight down a little. I ran out of room for that little shadow shape. Doing exactly what I always tell you not to do. Sort of got a little crowded down here in the bottom of the face. That usually happens when we make the nose a little too long or the head a little too small. So. Um, I'm frustrated that I make that correction so often. It's sort of like, it's like when you run out of room for the legs and you always have, in a figure, and you always have to erase the feet and draw them a little lower down. Um, it just means you probably don't practice enough. Or I may have just put the whole mouth a little too low down. But I'm not going to redraw the whole thing. So we're just going to forge ahead. Uh, you'll notice that in my drawing, it just feels like his head is just tilted slightly down, downward compared to the original. 
but we're just going to go with it. So the ear is level with the bottom of the nose out here, and then the hair cups around the back of the ear. Like that. A little sideburn. This hair is not incredibly puffy, but it does have a little bit of body, so we're lifting up above where we defined, you know, the location that we defined for the top of the skull. I'm going to throw a shadow over all this. And if you're not sure about the height of the forehead, go ahead and take a measurement. Um, if I measure off the screen, the length of the nose from here to the indent between the eyes is about the same as the distance between that indent and the, and the hairline. So I might, have, I might need to bring down the hairline just a little bit. Um, it's always appropriate to measure, but please try drawing it first and then measure to see how you did. Then you'll get better at your instincts will improve. If you just measure everything first and then draw it, um, your drawings will be perfect, but they will take you forever and um, you're not going to improve as quickly. And you're never going to have as much fun because what's fun in drawing is to just go for it and have it come out right versus turning yourself into a kind of machine that just knows how to plot uh, points in space. Um, that's the reason that people who learn to draw that way of plotting every point, why they're their drawings usually end up looking distressingly the same as other people learn to draw that way because unless you learn to develop and rely upon some degree of instinct, um, your drawings are going to lack um, any personal qualities, any flavor that's going to make them your own. Um, it's just as important, though, to know when your instincts are, learn when, where you, when your instincts are wrong. And that's what you can achieve by measuring the things that you've taken a stab at, which is exactly like just learning how to hit a target and then walking up, you know, after you've taken your shot to see how you did. So it would be fun to spend an hour and a half drawing all those individual locks of hair just as beautifully and precisely as we find in this original. But I'm about done with this demonstration.
think I've carried this far enough, so. And I'm gonna, would like to spend some time with my students. So, I'm gonna sign off of the video now. Um, if you're doing this at home, please see if you can get appropriate materials first. Um, it would be good if you could do this with some white highlights. And I will see you next time.